the last topic I'm going to talk about is training. And we talked about huge JSON object. Let's say you're saying query to the database, you're getting 10,000 results or maybe more, and you want to send them to the client. Uh, if you want to work in pure JSON, you need to construct one big JSON object which can consume memory. And memory, again, in hosting is money, right? If you need a bigger machine with more memory, you're going to pay more for that machine. If you're going to be able to work with smaller machines, this is going to save you money. Uh, so there is no support for streaming in the JSON form. For example, in YAML, you can have several documents in the same place, right? You can do uh, three dashes, and then uh, there is support for that. Then YAML can read them one after the other. Don't use YAML. It is very slow in uh, service to service. Really, don't, don't do that. But I'm just giving it as an example of how to do it. So what you can do, the thing is that JSON can be in a compressed format and then it can take only a single line. If you, even if you have new lines, even if you have many fields, it can still fit in a single line. So we leverage that fact and we say that when we stream JSON, we basically send one JSON object per line. Now the other side needs to know that. They need to know that, hey, I'm going to read a line and this is going to be first JSON object, second line, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This is known by the way as JSON lines or some ND JSON or new line delimited JSON. Um, but this is a pretty common practice. And the good news for you is that encoding JSON actually supports multiple JSON objects. What do I mean by that? So let's start with the input. I'm creating a JSON encoder. I have two events. One is a click and one is a move event and the coordinates of where the click was and where the move, uh, let's say the cursor. And now for every uh, range of events, I'm using the same encoder, right? It's not calling a new encoder, then encoding. I'm using the same encoder on this IO writer. And if I'm going to run this, you're going to see that automatically encoding JSON is adding a new line between these two JSON objects. I didn't add that, right? It was done by encoding JSON bytes. And now on the other side, this is streaming in, right? So we have uh, an event type, which is tracked with a type X and a Y. And I have this data, right, which is a click. And now I'm creating a new decoder on this data, right? And I converted it with strings that new reader, now it's an I reader, so I can read from. What I need to do now, when, when we have streaming, we don't know how many elements are coming in. I have no idea. So I need to do a possible infinite for loop. And in this for loop, I'm going to create this event that I want to decode into it. And I'm going to call decode on that. Now you can move the event outside of the for loop and then potentially remove one allocation, but then you're reusing the same event, meaning if there's still data, if someone said, let's say, forgot to send the Y, you're going to get the Y from the previous one. So I prefer to start afresh every time I do uh, deserialization or unmarshalling. Now, if you get the EOF and the file, this means there's no more data. I'm done. If there's another error, it is an error. And otherwise, I'm going to print out the event. And you see when we run it, I'm actually consuming them. So the encoder and the decoder, both of them are working well with, uh, with streaming JSON. If you're sending streaming JSON outside and someone is consuming it, let's say from Python, they need to know to read the single line converted to JSON with another single line converted to JSON because the Python uh, JSON library does not know how to do it. So again, this needs to be some kind of a contract between the producer and the consumer. But in Go, if you do it from Go to Go, this is going to work. Now, streaming is really nice, but when you think about HTTP, uh, HTTP you send the, request, the response body as one big chunk. Well, you don't have to. In HTTP, specifically since HTTP 1.1, we have something known as a chunk encoding. In chunk encoding, uh, the server is telling you, hey, I'm going to send you um, in the transfer encoding uh, header, I'm going to say this is going to be chunks, and then I'm not going to tell you how many bytes are coming up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you one chunk after another, and previous to each chunk, I'm going to write how many bytes it's going to be. Then I'm going to write 
uh, the chunk data, how many bytes, and then an empty line, etc., etc., until the last chunk, which is zero length, and then you know that the data is done. We can combine that with the way that we saw that the encoder is actually encoding one JSON object per line to send data streaming in HTTP, right? So here's our handler. The handler uh, is going to uh, get some kind of a request. We are going to create what is known as a response controller. Response controller gives us some extra capabilities over this W, the response writer, which are more than just writing and setting the status quo. And now I'm creating a new encoder on top of this W, the HP response writer implements IO writer, so I can use the JSON encoder on it. And then for every event I have on, I wrote some query event, I'm going to encode this event here. Now, there is an interesting thing here. You started sending a request, meaning we already set the HTTP status code on the request because we have the status code first and then the data coming in. So if I'm starting sending that, I'm sending 200, okay? And now I have an error encoding. I have no way of notifying the client that in the HTTP protocol itself, I can send it into JSON maybe or something else, but I have no way to tell the client there is some kind of an error. So your best thing is actually to log something. So I'm using that, the US log package, for just some coding and I'm returning, but I have no way to go back to the HTTP first line of the HTTP and say, you know what, actually there's an internal server. There's no way to do it. And this is true. Now the trick is to do flush after each time you do an encode. Once you do flush, this is actually going to cause it to become a chunked encoding. And now you're going to get one after the other after that. Now, if I'm going to use a web browser or uh, to see uh, or CRL or something else, I'm going to get the response after it's being uh, already passed. So what I'm going to do is to show a session with a utility called Netcat. Netcat, or the command line is called NC, is working on raw sockets. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an HTTP request. I'm doing a GET. So EOF tells it basically to read from here up to here, right? So this is the first line in the HTTP request. I'm saying get, right? This is the verb. Then slash events, that's the path. And I'm uh, doing uh, HTTP 1.1. The, the only required header in HTTP request is the host header. This is the only required header. So uh, you can ignore all headers. But I'm also telling you the server that once you're done sending the data, please close the connection. And now, you see the response that you're sending. So the sender will is sending me HTTP 1.1, 200, okay, right? And it says that the transfer encoding is chunk. And now it's telling me, hey, the first chunk is 21 bytes. Here's the chunk. Now there's an empty line. The second one is 20 bytes because move is one letter less than click. Uh, and here's the data. And then an empty line. And then it says zero. This is the no more data is coming. So this is a way for you actually to stream out a huge amount of data, um, but you need to be aware of HTTP timeouts, right? So you can't stream for an hour. This is not going to work. You probably need something else. But instead of constructing a lot of, uh, a really big JSON and consuming a lot of memory, you can say, you know what? I have a, a megabyte of data to send to you, but I'm not going to use a megabyte of memory. I'm just going to, let's say one row from the database after another. Maybe each of them is a single K. So we can use a smaller machine and save money.